Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, it's a uh, midwinter doldrum time. Um... We've got a lot of, well, there's still snow outside. We've had this bad cold snap going on. It's, uh, well, something we haven't had in northern New Jersey for a couple of winters now. But on the plus side, I've been lining up pod guests all the way through June at this point. So that, that gives me some sort of vision of a warmer, sunnier days ahead, you know? Plus, there's the anxiety of how on earth I'm going to manage to read everything and record with everybody. Um, and that, that revs me up also and gets me out of the uh, uh, the down phase, I guess. But let's dive into this week's show. Um, my guest this time is the legendary film critic David Thompson, who has a brand new book out today from Yale University Press called Remotely, Travels in the Binge of TV. David and I recorded like two years ago uh, when Yale put out Disaster Mon Amour, his reflections on disaster movies and um, his adopted home of, of San Francisco. This time around, David is writing about a different sort of disaster with this book, namely what a long married couple decides to watch on TV during a pandemic. Um, that's sort of blithe. I mean, remotely is about David and his wife Lucy's dip in the endless stream of, of streaming TV. It's it's a fantastic exploration of how TV has changed, how we've changed, how it's changed us, and what the last few years especially have wrought. Uh, David as I said, legendary film critic, he brings his his critic's eye to bear on, on some shows. But this is not a guide of what to watch and, and what to avoid, um, because there's just too much. Um, it's more it's more of a freewheeling examination of what life is like today, as reflected on or, or by the screen. And he uses their TV selections through lockdown and, and into the reopening of the world to examine what TV feels like and what it means to give up the, the communal in favor of the solitary and, and what it's like when that's been forced on us instead of a, a, you know, a decision we make. And he gives his wife, Lucy, a voice and, and some of the best lines in the book, um, sort of evoking the, the conversational vibe of a long-married couple, where you can almost imagine them looking not at each other, but, but both at the TV while they talk. Um, it's an interesting and fascinating book. I loved Remotely, especially the way David manages to capture so many aspects of what it's like to be in this whole everything's pretty good and nothing's great mode without romanticizing the old days by any means. It does go back. I mean, there there are there are citations of the Foresight Saga and other, other I Love Lucy and other classic uh, pieces of TV as part of this examination of, of the continuum of it all, I guess. But he's amazingly perceptive about the underlying meaning of what we're up to when we're in front of the TV, above and beyond the, the critical merits of like, uh, Babylon Berlin or, or Ozark, both of which he, he really likes. So if you've been in front of the tube these past few years, wondering if you've already seen this show and you're you're not quite sure, give remotely a read. It'll it'll make you look at the screen and your reflection in it a lot differently. Now, no real caveats for this one. Um, I will note that David and I were going to record this in person when I was in San Francisco about two weeks ago, but he got whomped by a, a head cold and emailed me that morning saying, A, he didn't want to get me sick. B, he may not be at his most coherent that day. So we had to do this one remotely. And he didn't have headphones on, so there's a couple of little uh, audio feedback glitches, but I, I edited most of that out. 
Now, here's David's bio. David Thompson is a film critic, a historian, and the author of more than 30 books, including Disaster Mon Amour, Why Acting Matters, and The Biographical Dictionary of Film. He lives in San Francisco, California. And now, the 2024 Virtual Memories Conversation with David Thompson. So tell me, how did Remotely take shape? It's it's a book that very much feels as though it's in the process of becoming itself, if that makes sense. Can you can you talk a little about the uh, the nature of it and how it came together? That's a nice that's a nice way of putting it. And I I mean I think like most people, uh after a fairly short period of the whole COVID insurrection, uh, I felt the world was changing. It was not clear whether it was changing for good or the opposite of good, and I still don't feel confident about that. But I did feel that television the thing I still call television, although that that term is inadequate, I think now. Um, I felt that 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 machine was very important to what was going on. And as someone who had always been fascinated by the communal experience of going to the movies, which, you know, is one of the most exciting and important experiences in life I've ever had, closely allied to the the feeling of going to a packed sports arena and being part of that excitement and anger and fun in watching a game. Um, going to the movies was my first realization that I was living in a very crowded world. Um, born and raised in suburban South London, it was easy to believe that nothing but the locality I lived in existed. But the movies uh, said, no, something different. And, and when I went to the movies in those places, it was in theaters that held easily held 2,000 people, which, you know, by today's standards is an incredible number of people seeing a single movie. And invariably, the place was packed. Um, I often had to stand in line, queue as it's mm -hmm. called in England, to get in. And sometimes I was actually turned away because the house was full. And, and um, no one today really has ever had that experience, I think. Um, but... When people laughed in unison, even if I didn't really think what they were laughing at was funny, I was thrilled by that communal, mass, crowded reaction. And similarly, when they were afraid or when they were exuberant in a chase or when the bad guys were being shot down. So being in a crowd for me, was vital to watching movies because I didn't feel I was alone watching mm. them. And I, I realized that television was always a different kind of experience. It was domestic. It was the family. You might literally be alone watching television. But in COVID and in, in that time of lockdown, the solitude and the feeling of you being extracted or removed from the larger world was uh, more potent, I felt, than the sort of ordinary response to TV from the 50s onwards. And I was watching invariably with my wife, twin sofas in what we call the TV room. And something strange happened to 
our relationship. I mean, it, 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 it's a long relationship. We've been together a long time, over 40 years. Uh, we're deeply fond. But we started talking about the shows we were watching. And there was a way in which I think we both felt we were plunged a little deeper in our relationship. Um, and that was essentially a very good thing, very nice thing. But it, it's, it did kind of change our relationship with the shows we were watching, which we might not have talked about very much in the past. And we sometimes discovered that we had different reactions to them, and that was intriguing. So the idea occurred to me that uh, there might be a book in our situation, which, you know, watching television night after night, really, sometimes casually, not really knowing what we would see, but sometimes finding a show we loved and binging on it to the extent that we might watch several seasons of it in a week or even a shorter time than that and talking about it and arguing about it. And I thought there was a book in there that was getting at the, the odd ways in which our use of television now is different from television in its, say, first 50 or so years, because it's, it's sort of saying to us now, you do realize, don't you, that uh, you're alone in the world and that the authority sense that you had in the medium is not quite there. In other words, and this I think is a tremendously important point about how we are experiencing life now, no one's in charge. Yeah. It's not going to be all right. Uh, there might be a war. There might be a disaster that will get out of hand. You know that. And you feel in more jeopardy because of that. But while you're feeling uneasy and anxious, why not try tonight's program? And I found that whole dilemma, that whole situation, very intriguing, rather sinister, but quite amusing too. And and so I sort of began to write about it, almost keeping a journal. Uh, the book is not an exact journal of what my wife and I said to each other, although occasionally there are lines in the book that come from life. But I I created us as characters yeah. in the book. We do not watch every, we do not talk about every show we actually watched, let alone every show that we could have watched. I picked shows that I found interesting one way or another, many of them contemporary shows, but some of them going way back, going back even to the sort of early days of TV. So long answer to your question, but that. That's sort of how the book came into being. Did you find you needed a sort of different critical faculty for writing about TV versus versus writing about movies? And I know it's not a critical, yeah, critical I, book, but it's still, it, you know, you, you do bring that David Thompson thing to bear. It certainly yeah. is. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I did feel that it didn't really matter that much how good these shows are. And I think that has always been inherent in the nature of TV. TV is what TV puts on for you any night. You, you seem to have more control over what you watch now than in the early days of TV because you can stream, you can select, you can go to the, uh, the programming systems and find out what they have to offer. There's far more than you can comprehend, let alone watch, but you can pick and choose. But even so, I think people who watch television have, have a sort of basic view that it's all, it's all sort of yeah, mediocre. Everything's good, nothing's great. It, 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 yeah. it, that, that's, that's the thing. So I didn't want to write a book 
that was full of oh so and so Babylon Berlin, let's say, is one of the greatest shows of all time, which I actually believe. And I say something like that in the book, because I don't know that Babylon Berlin is that different from the hundreds of shows that I've probably forgotten the names of because they didn't sink in. They didn't make an impact. Uh, so it's not a critic's book in that way. It's, it's, um, it's much more the book of a couple who are watching TV rather in the way that they might watch the weather every day. So, you know, one of them might say, oh, it doesn't look so good today. And the other, and the other person might say, yeah, but I think it'll improve. And he, <laughs> she says, well, I hope, I hope you're right, but let's get on with it. A sort of climatic yeah. context in which the shows all come together. And um, I'm fascinated by the way now that you, when you turn your television on, you can, in a moment or two, you can see thousands of shows that you could watch. Unbelievable that human beings have actually made all these shows. And when, if you get to some of them, it's even more unbelievable that the shows were made <laughs> and are put on because some of them are so bad. <laughs> it's impossible. But, and yet we watch some of the bad shows nonetheless. I, ju I just don't think that critical eminence, if you know what I mean, A is better than B, which is far worse than D. I don't think it matters that much with television. And I think something has happened with the material on television where it's almost redundant that we have an opinion about it. That is a, that's another measure of our being isolated or cut off from the world that has organized television. And, and I'm uncertain about these things and uh, I, I try to explore them in the book but I was raised to be critical of films. I was a film critic for a long time. I still am in many ways. But I don't think television is, um, I don't think it's affected by criticism. Yeah. I mean, there is television criticism in some newspapers. I don't think anyone reads it. I, I think that, I think we all, believe that television has passed beyond the whole level and whole question of being good or bad. The thing about television is, is it on or is it off? And yeah. that's another thing that sank in during this COVID period very much. And I think it's going to increase. We're at what I take to be near the end of a golden age of television. I think that, you know, the last 20 years, broadly speaking, have been very good for television. I think the, the rise of the long form narrative, shows like The Wire, Sopranos, Breaking Bad, things like that. I think it's a great period. I think it's very, very good work. I actually think in general, that work is and was better than the best movies being made in America at the same time. I think it's coming to an end. I think that the companies that make the material are more and more into now just putting something out there, anything out there. And content. That's that's they, they don't think of movies or stories, they think content. of content. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, that's not a cheerful thought. Because if we're going to spend four hours a night or more watching television, we like to think we're watching something good. And, and yet, a lot of the time, I think, we're watching stuff that we know is not very good, but it's on. Yeah. <laughs> and it's being on offers a vague kind of comfort. It, it, it makes you think the world is out there. Once upon a time, People watched a lot of television that was clearly now and of the moment, like 
the news. I don't think people attend to the news on television much anymore. No. I don't think they feel there's any point in being in contact with that world. I, th I think that for every pundit who says this is the most election we will ever face coming up, I think they're likely to be confounded and dumbfounded by a diminishing interest in the election as 2024 goes along. I think we've given up believing in that outside world, the, the world of politics, the world of control, of someone being in charge. I think the miracle now is that any grown people would want to be president of this world. It's a kind of indication that they're probably crazy, which is not comforting in itself. So, you know, television has lost that contact with uh, the real world. The only place I feel I get it is watching live sport. And I, I, I'm a, I, I was probably more shaped by live sport on television than by any of the great movies I ever saw. Oh. And... and um, uh, uh, puts me in mind of. I mean, last night, for oh, instance, I was what? Yeah. Oh, you had the the Forty Nine ers game yeah, last no. night, but but it put me in mind during the early days of lockdown. The, 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 I was going to say during during the er, that first summer of lockdown in twenty twenty, when we had no sports going on, and ESPN started airing the Last Dance, the Michael Jordan Chicago Bulls nineteen ninety eight documentary, and the. The way the sports audience world just flocked to that week after week, it was just the we've got nothing else, but we've got this this story from 22 years ago, and we are all going to watch this because this is the closest we can get to sport, you know? Yeah. Well, it, it, it's like that series about the Lakers in oh, yeah. that period, which was a trashy series, <laughs> but I couldn't take my eyes off it. I watched every episode, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's just something that, that again, that, that intersection of it. And I think the all these streaming platforms are getting the idea now that, that live sports is the one thing that will bring people, you know, uh, to their platform because all the programming uh, – it's my wife's biggest yeah, question is, you know, so. what I, what streaming – what platform is that on? You know, who who's – is this Netflix or Max or Peacock? Yeah. There's no identity anymore. So, yeah. Well – I do think along the lines of what you're saying that it won't be a surprise if we find a, a range of new sports, relatively new, coming on TV. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I was raised watching snooker, which is the British version of pool, more or less, on television. And it is actually a brilliant game on television because the, the close-up of the table and the faces and the cue sticks and the balls and everything, it's great television. It's very big television in England. Not so much here, but I think it can become so. And, you know, there are more and more mainstream network shows, if you, if you understand that network television does still exist, there are more and more of those shows that are built around astonishing games that people have cooked up as if they were writing scripts. Shows like The Floor, for instance. And I think it's going to be more and more of that. And the games will be crazier and crazier. And real sports fans will be very lofty and superior about them and say, well, they're not, that's not really sport. That, that's a game show. Yeah. But. <laughs> Absolutely, yes, big yeah. thing. But yeah, it's it's there are ways. I, I think you're you're right. The book, you know, resonated with me in a lot of ways because of how we, how that period of enforced time spent in the living room really changed us. Um, you know, and how we looked at for me and my wife. Part of it was going back to like Mary Tyler Moore show and Barney Miller and and things from the 70s and just doing long dives into that instead of whatever was the the contemporary thing because we weren't seeing people anyway. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. really, no. But I think that the, you know that period and it, it continues it's been very kind to old mm. shows. And um 
you know, I know a couple of people who, when Norman Lear died, um, and they really didn't know who Norman Lear was. These were young people. And because of that, they started to look at All in the Family again. Now, All in the Family is dated a lot, but one of the ways it's dated is that it is so incredibly good about real, urgent issues in our society. And this is an America that cries out for a new kind of all in the family, you know, where there are Trump voters and Biden voters in the same household. And, and you realize what an amazing achievement Norman Lear pulled off and the people who actually made the show all the time. Uh, and um, a lot of those old series, they have a value that is partly nostalgic and it's partly quaint and cozy, but they were very good shows. And, you know, they were like 30-minute yeah. episodes packed with stuff and brilliant comic but acting. That's part too. of it. A, these were 24, 26 episodes a season. B, like I say with Mary Tyler Moore, yeah. every cast member was a hit i mean you every one of them could have carried their own show yes. and it's one of those and they all have their shows. yeah yeah they, they were incredible yeah. but but yeah it's it's i was gonna say it's a very brave book also because in in the weekly emails that i, I send out and all this if i mention a tv show i will i will get People will jump down my throat either for liking something that they think is the most meretricious piece of crap in the world or not liking something that they think is the greatest thing that's ever been made. <laughs> so all credit to you for actually, you know, putting some not not making a critical guide, but at least showing that you you watch certain shows and had value judgments about some of them. So well done. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't want this to be remotely like no. a critical yeah. guide. I've, I've done books on the cinema that really try in a very pretentious, rather aggressive way to say, this is what you should be watching. <laughs> this is what's good for you. I didn't want that kind of a book. I wanted a book that said, I know the ugly truth is that night after night you watch crap and you keep watching. It. You know it's crap, but you keep watching it and – you don't ask yourself maybe sufficiently about what the diet of crap is doing to you. So, I mean, this book gets at, at that. It says what what is the what are the implications and the impact of crap over a long period of time? And I think our society needs to ask questions like that. But uh, I'm not sure that there is such a thing as a great show or a really bad show. Um, if you're watching it, then it's on. Yeah. And that's what television is about, just being on. So tell me about the way Remotely comes together, the decision to, to give your wife a voice throughout it. She has all these italicized one-liners. There's a, a give and take in various chapters between your narrator voice and, and hers, sort of a, a Lucy and David versus the, the yeah. Lucy and Ricky thing, well, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I felt that there was a danger, which is probably inherent in my character and personality as a writer, that the book would turn into a series of mm -hmm. lectures and uh, a laying down of the law. And one of the things I've learned in being married to Lucy for this long is that she has got a, a wonderful instinct and capacity for puncturing my pretensions and my diatribes with a line or two that brings everything back down to earth. In that way, the book really comes from life, even if it's not word for word from life. It's about an attitude between two people and I think, I, I think it's a common experience. I'm not saying it's a universal, but it's a common experience that couples who have been together a long time and have been through obvious ups and downs because you can't be together for a long time without saying, what the <laughs> hell am I doing with this person? And then a year or two later, you say, well, of course, that's why I'm with this person. You, you're on a roundabout. And... You learn to 
sort of engage in a dialogue with the person that can be sarcastic and teasing, but fond, and but argumentative. Um, I I have a really deep seated opinion that if a relationship is going to last, a relationship of any kind, if it's really going to last and be better than say a man and his dog, then the two the two forces in it have to argue. And sometimes the argument will get out of hand, it will get fierce, and someone will walk out of the room and slam the door. They'll come back, but for the moment there's a an abrupt intervention. And um I wanted to get that kind of feeling and, and I, I had life to draw upon, which is where I am inclined to make rather broad general statements about life. And Lucy will come in with a one liner that um, makes me look foolish. <laughs> and and yeah. um, once I started thinking that way and, or observing that way and writing that way, the book became a lot of fun to do. And, and, uh, when I had finished a draft of it, I showed it to Lucy so that uh, in some cases she said, well, I would never say that. Uh, and I said, well, I thought you would say that. And she said, come on, I, I would say this instead. And I replaced some of my original lines with her idea of what she would say. So, you know, that, that kind of comedy goes on. And... Um, but it holds up like a sitcom. To write a book, you have to enjoy it. And the, yeah. yeah, there are so many ways in which you could enjoy writing a book. But that kind of sitcom repartee, dialogue, and I do think that really is very common in loving relationships, uh, was something I wanted to get. And uh, the publisher was very kind to it. And I think took a deep breath and said, sure, let's do that. And we went with it, and um, it's one of the things I'm most pleased about. In the book. I, I really dug it, and one of the neat and it's just coincidental counterposes is our one of our current long watches. And I don't binge; we just watch one episode a night of whatever we're watching. Um, we inexplicably fell on Everybody Loves Raymond, just because I'd never seen it when it happened. Let's go. Yeah, let me let me see what the dynamic is, how it works, how it changes. By season six, these characters hate each other. The level of vitriol and and spite <laughs> between the husband and wife, between the the in laws, it is so mean. My wife yesterday was like, I wonder if season nine ends with them getting divorced, because that's the only thing that would make sense at this point. But, you know, seeing how you guys <laughs> manage to have good communication and arguments, but, you know, staying good natured over all this time. Um, well, you're doing a lot better than, than Ray and Deborah were. I'll put it that way. <laughs> well, okay. But, you know, I mean, you mentioned, you alluded to I Love Lucy, and Obviously, that was in my head the whole time uh, because that was an extraordinary show, not just in the the way it was done, the technique, not just in the putting together of two people who might not have been allowed to be together on a show had they not actually been married. Um, but uh, it's a couple that are at real cross purposes most of the time. And, you know, they, they regularly believe they're living with a mad person. And they are in a certain way. And and I don't want to get too serious about it, but there is a level, I think, at which a couple that have been together a long time do know they're living with a crazy person. You get to know the other person well enough that you say, oh, God, here it comes again. She's crazy. <laughs> Or he's going to go through that mad routine again. And I find that very funny. It's obviously not that far from tragedy or violence even. I mean, you know, people people who know each other murder each other much more commonly than people yeah, who don't true. know each other. <laughs> and that's because company, company can grate and be very, very tiring. Um, but it's also enormously funny and, and I love the tradition in American movies which really is not 
honored very much anymore of couples who are in love but don't quite admit it and argue and fight all the time. The era of the late 30s and the early 40s, a film like His Girl Friday, mm. if you remember, uh, where a couple have actually got divorced because they think they don't love each other. Uh, but every time they start talking to each other, quarreling, squabbling, disagreeing, teasing, it's clear that they still are absolutely dependent on each other. I love that form in art because I think it's absolutely reflective of a, a way in which people live together or try to live together. And I think almost the most depressing thing about some couples is that when they fall silent, when they don't argue anymore, yeah. because that's as if they've really given up the ghost Argument is is a very important way of staying alive. I get you. In in our case, there's also both my wife and and our sister in law know my parents, so they understand that as insane as my brother and I are, we could be so much worse. They 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 get you know. Oh, well, yeah, we see where they came from. They're doing better than they could have been yeah. doing. But but no, I, I get you. And the longer we've been together, twenty years, Amy and I, and it's. Yeah, she she recognizes some of the, a lot of the insanities, but but being able to talk through this stuff, even just a couple of nights ago, we tried, and this is violating my whole thing about talking about shows that I've watched and 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 liked or disliked. The new season of True Detective started, and yeah, I oh, I saw the yeah. first episode. We oh. only watched the first season, um, and I was so disappointed by the ending of that, and never watched the the subsequent ones. But she mentioned wanting to watch it. We watch. I said, I have no interest in what yes. happens to any of these characters. You're on your own. <laughs> I'll, I'll go downstairs and draw while yep. you, you watch the, the, the subsequent ones. And it's okay, you know, but yes. I get I get how there are conflicts yes. over this stuff. No, I, but. I thought the first season of True Detective was a very exciting show. It was. It's just the finale and that, that let me down. I, I was captivated by the first seven episodes. Yeah. Yeah. It's long. And... and you know, I I like Jodie Foster as an actress and a personality very much, and and uh, to see her so grim and and so unfunny on a show is a very off putting thing. Yeah. But I will stick with it a bit longer. Yes, yeah, you, you've got yeah. you know yeah. I don't say responsibilities, but different dynamic, and you know I I could see you spending the time with that one. Although yeah. it raises the question. And this yeah. is something I asked Clive James, and I know you're not in Clive James's boat when it came to, to what his health was like when, when I recorded with him. He was a few years from, from dying, and I asked him at the time, what series are you afraid you won't get to see the end of? Because for him, Game of Thrones and finding out what happens was a reason to stay alive all those years. Um, is there something that you just have the, oh, my gosh, I, I want to stick around just so I can see X, Y, or Z and how it comes together? Uh not in that way, no. And I, I do think that the the suspenseful quality in some of those multi-season shows, Game of Thrones, uh, Breaking Bad, uh, the, the, that was a really classic old-fashioned suspense. And you tuned in because you did not know and you cared. You wanted to know what was going to happen. And and um, I think that element of suspense is not as common in, in these shows now as it was even a few years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And I, But I do understand uh, what Clive James uh, was saying. And, and, and um, uh, we first met, actually, because we worked for the same publishing house in England, and uh, I was very fond of him. And, uh, we didn't agree a great deal, but but uh, a wonderful television writer, one of the people I think who really said, look, if you're going to watch television, which is a pretty half-baked <laughs> thing, but if you're going to watch it and you're going to read about it, the writing about television has got to be different from theatre reviews or fiction reviews or film reviews. And he did a lot to pioneer a sort of casual but actually deeply informed, rather mocking but fond view of the whole medium. And, and 
one of the most important writers on television. Yeah, he was he was special. Only got to meet him the the one time. It was one of the high points of my life at this point, just getting to sit down with him for an hour and a half and, and then Good. banter afterwards. Good. But yeah, there was that sense yeah. of taking yeah. it seriously, but not not treating it seriously, I guess. You know, t- taking the medium seriously, but not having to make well, it that, heavy. I think, that, I think that's exactly the thing that television commentary should have, yeah. Yeah, sort of lightness. I mean, people are, t- are terribly serious now about some films, and, and uh, I, it sometimes worries me because I know too much about how casually, you know, facetiously almost, some of the movies have been made and how, how chancy it is, whether they do this or that mm-hmm. at the end. And, and, and uh, Movies are very seldom made to be engraved in stone. They're 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 sketches on plastic, and and uh, finding a way to write about it that catches that is very difficult. And Clive at, with TV was really a pioneer in getting a language and a tone, an attitude to the medium. Now, one of the things in remotely that really jumped out at me, and I agree with you on advertising. As the bane slash perversion oh. of TV and what it meant to have BBC, uh, yeah. you know, uh, uh, citizen funded, basically publicly funded, um, how, how that at least gave a different template than what we had in America. But um, well, <laughs> go on about advertising if, if you feel like and how streaming platforms tried to do the no advertising mentality and they've all folded now and started adding these these ad tiers to to everything they're doing. Well, you know, I, I, I am I am nakedly British in this respect. I was um, I was formed by BBC Television, uh, which began before there was any commercial programming in Britain, and it was taken for granted in those days that television in its reach and its impact was potentially serious and important. It had a huge uh, chance of educating people. Uh, Therefore, it was alien to what the medium was and should be that you would interrupt things that you would thought about having said that might be about a drama, a story, might be about the war in Korea or wherever. But they had a natural gravity to them that you should interrupt those things with the language that wanted to sell products that in most cases you knew were certainly not essential to life and probably were meretricious and probably were even corrupting and dangerous. And in Britain, to this day, the BBC does not have advertising, although the BBC is not what it was. But I find, as I grow older, the intrusion of advertising in life, not just in television, but in many other forms, I find it so distressing it sort of drives me crazy uh, and i will i will turn off television and radio just because there is advertising on there and i i i still entertain the reformist hope that advertising could and should be banned outright now i know people will say oh but the economy will grind to a halt if you don't have advertising. I don't believe it. I do not accept the legend that advertising works. Oh, it's only 50% that works. The the problem is nobody knows which 50%. That's uh, (laughs) always been the the, the line. Exactly. I think we all know the damage, the damage to sense and understanding and communication that are being done in its name and there's not an earthly chance of of this being carried out 
uh, it would be comical if any candidate actually proposed it. But if I were in that position, I would ask for a ban on all advertising. Remember, so you know you're listening to. A- <laughs> <laughs> Remember watching baseball the first time. I think it was the playoff games where they started doing the green screen thing so they could change the ads behind the batter for whoever was watching on TV. Yes. And it was just the, yeah. so we don't, we're not really seeing reality here. We're, we're watching a baseball game where you've already started superimposing ads for, for the, the TV audience in a way that's, that's right. Yeah. And again, we're dating ourselves here for me. That's like late nineties Yankees playoff games, I think. But um, that's also me revealing my Yankee thing, but yeah, that's, that's, yeah, Yeah. I'm, I'm willing to, to live with being a Yankee man, but it's, no, I was going to say in America, we had something similar the way HBO developed with that idea of we're going to subsist on subscriber money, not advertising. So we don't have to worry about it. And then eventually the money gets too big. It gets part of a giant corporate debt load and you now need to, to start Yes. Making lowest yeah. common denominator to, uh, sort of shows. Yeah. But, you know, the the British model was and still is that if, if you're going to have a television set, you pay a license fee. Yeah. Uh, I think the license fee now is a little over £100 a year, which sounds like a big sum. But if you think about how many hours you're going to watch it, it, it comes down to tiny sums of money and the idea was it's been corrupted but the idea was that the bbc's production would be funded by the license fee money now it's terribly open to compromise and uh trickery as a system but i don't think that knocks or diminishes how far it is a good idea and uh as I say, it's not going to happen. We're talking about the un- the unlikely and the the unknown, but I don't think it's a subject or an approach that we should give up. I will say, I, I just looked it up. It's one hundred and fifty nine pounds a year, but fifty three fifty three uh, fifty okay. for a yes. black and white TV set, which raises the question: Who has a black and white TV set? Does that tell you a lot? <laughs> I, Even less if we turn off. <laughs> yeah, I, black and white. T- I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine anyone who owns one is able to watch anything. But <laughs> but sweep the country. Yes, amazing. <laughs> it's like a sketch from yeah. <laughs> but um, it, when it came to to shows that you did focus on, I know again we're not talking about a guide for you know who should be watching what, but Ozark. I only did the first episode. Should should I go all in on that one? Well, I I really fell in love with Ozark. And and I think that, I think what I liked about it was that within the sort of quite complicated narrative formula that it works out, you see the the study of a family, a, a sort of decent, or not ordinary, but a decent family trying to do their best and their lives are corrupted by money. Now, I I think in general that while American entertainment is the fruit of money and it's out to make money, it does not treat the subject of money and how it changes us sufficiently. And Ozark does, and it's about money destroying a family and the members of that family. I thought it was very well written. I thought the acting, I thought Laura Linney, who is one of the great TV actresses, I think, is absolutely remarkable in it. Julia Garner established a whole career in it. And Jason Bateman, who in many ways can be sort of almost written off as a standard fill-in-the-gap kind of TV actor. Uh, I thought he did a great, great job in Ozark. And, and, you know, sometimes 
we give up on a show after a few episodes because we know that most shows fall off fast sure. after a snappy beginning. I I stuck with Ozark, and I thought it reached a point where it began to get better and better. And, and I really treasure the whole thing now. But I I don't want to make a big thing about saying, if you watch Ozark, you'll be saved. You know, I'm just telling you what it did for me. There are other shows that I've heard other people say. For instance, I'm not a huge admirer of Succession. I'm not saying Succession isn't good or that it's bad. It just didn't hit me in a certain I, way. I was very thankful and, and, the way you wrote about it, because I, I, it's another show that I did a few episodes of, and I thought, I get this. They're, they're horrible people who are going to be mean to each other and everyone around them, and it's going to be a chess match of who backstabs whom, and I don't care about any of these people. And, and I, I think you, you really capture that, especially the right. chess that's aspect of it. Yeah. 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 The yeah. thing about it also yeah. that got to me, building up to the finale of Succession, when you talked about the, the way that tension uh, or cliffhangers, in a sense, are, are, are no more, there was a huge buildup to the ending of that show. And it's been a few months now, and nobody talks about succession in the slightest. It, it, the moment it ended, it vanished. Well, you know? yeah. I, I, I mean, I think that I, I take television seriously. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I have a diary in which I actually note down shows that I watch. Uh, and I'm horrified to admit that I regularly... Not that often, but it it happens. It keeps happening. I will turn on a show, and I realize after half an hour that I've seen it before, <laughs> and I'd forgot not that long ago. Now, you know, in my early 80s, and people do forget. Uh, but I think television almost caters to that. You know, <laughs> it almost shows you something and says, have you forgotten you've seen this before? Because so much of television, new series, actually leave you quite quickly with the feeling that you have seen it before because they are, they are so repetitive. They, they, they reproduce yeah. what they've done before. And sometimes they use the same actors. So, you know, uh, even, even someone like Laura Linney, who I think is a tremendous actress, I've seen her in different shows and I'm not quite sure that I can separate her close up in one show from that in another. Uh, so it, it's, um, you can't really say something was a great work. If you have a feeling that in three years time, you won't re remember it. And yet that I think is in the nature of TV. Sure. And it's, it's why for all the criticism people had about the ending of the Sopranos, no one has forgotten it. You know, all this time later, all these years, people still have where they were when the screen went black. <laughs> it's just Something amazing. That was profoundly enigmatic and quite shocking. So at the time, because there was a lot of criticism of that yep. ending at the time as to saying, well, that's a cheat. That's a letdown. You haven't really settled the show. However, just as you say, everyone remembers yeah. it now. Even people who right. didn't they see know the that it ended time. with a black they screen. Remember the <laughs> yeah, and and you know, I had a co yeah. whole conversation yeah. with Emily Nussbaum about sticking the landing. You know how many shows just fail on landing, and that was it, it was off mic during our podcast because we didn't want to savage show after show after show. But it was still that sense of yeah. nobody knows when you know or how to end something correctly, um, and and that. David Chase took a chance and did something yes. everybody remembers. But what you were just saying puts me in mind of something yeah. early on in the book where you mentioned how remotely is, I wrote it down here, a history of attention as well as forgetting. And that that yes. TV really is both of those. You know, it's all about capturing our eyeballs and how it, it slides right off of us the moment we, we turn off the remote. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, th I think that something is happening to human attention. Um, 
I don't think it's expected of us in exactly the same way. And I think that, I, I mean, for instance, there's a lot of incredulous commentary in the media these days about why people still vote for or believe in that man. I'm no, not no, going to name him, but you know who I mean. <laughs> and, the fact, and the fact is that we don't really care. And the reason why he might win is not that he has enough people who will vote for him if they have to go through hell for it, but that we have so many people who might not even vote. Yeah. And that says something about where the level of attention is these days. There is so much bad stuff out there in the world that a lot of us, I think, in a lot of moods and days, have given up the thought that this can be saved. And God knows where we go after that. I'm with you. It's, um, again, in my early 50s, a very disheartening transformation, I guess. Well, I know. You know and for you in your yeah. 80s and yeah. having, you know, two... two, 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 two so guys. give me a new show tonight. <laughs> Yeah, that's going to be the toughie <laughs> now. I'm, I'm trying to think of anything we're actually watching. The the one thing that came up when I, I did a follow-up with Brett Martin, who did a book about the directors of some of the great shows, David Chase, David Simon, um, uh, Vince Gilligan. Um, we had a conversation about MASH, which I've been re-watching. And I have to admit that a friend of mine was right. The early episodes are actually the better ones for something we remember as yeah. being so yeah. important as as the the seasons progressed and it had all this this great meaning and and really it it's tough to watch how overwrought the the political messaging in it was yeah and it's yeah. one of those well those early, early ones are actually yeah. good still got all the the politics they needed to but were a lot more fun to watch but yeah it's um that's yeah. a little weird yeah but the the other question, yeah. besides what you're watching, what are you reading? Are you uh, immersed in anything? Well, um, I was, I yeah, I can. I was given for Christmas by Lucy, in fact, a novel, The Maniac, by Benjamin. Oh, I've heard that's great. L a b a t u t. Yeah. It is an incredible book. It's a, it, it's, it's a nonfiction novel, as it calls itself, in that all the people in it are real, actual people. The central character is John van Neumann, who was one of the great mathematicians, was a crucial figure in the evolution of the atom bomb, uh, of game theory, and many other things. And... This is a book that gets inside the genius heads of very disturbed people who were remaking the world. And I cannot tell you how exciting a book it is to read. Uh, and I, 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 I love it. It's a terrifying book. And, uh, you know, it, it's clearly a book about the coming of artificial intelligence. But... Uh, I, I, I have read it and I'm now rereading yeah. it quite soon because it was a Christmas present. Uh, and, um, uh, I would urge your listeners and you to, to try it. It's a great book. Yeah. I think New York Review Books sent me his, his first novel, which, uh, apparently had a great Zabald sort of intermingling of, of fact and fiction. Um, it's supposed to be fantastic yeah. too, but yeah, I've heard great stuff about the maniac. Yeah. So, and um, if you ask me for a yeah, moment, I was just about to. <laughs> I think poor things. Yeah. I think poor things. Great film. I love. Are you it. getting out to the the theater? Oh sure, I go to the theater as much as I can. I I, I still believe in theaters, and, and and you know, generally these days they're very empty places on the whole. It was a lot of fun seeing Barbie. <laughs> with a huge crowd of young people dressed in pink who were talking back to the screen the whole time. And, <laughs> and it rem it reminded one of the great rowdy days of packed cinema going. 
but clearly that mood is over. It's not going to come back. Um, but I, but but I will always try to see a movie in a theater, particularly one that I really like. And Poor Things is, apart from anything else, it is visually one of the most beautiful films. Its use of decor and space is dreamlike. Mm. And Emma Stone, I don't think Poor Things will win the Best Picture Oscar, but it will be a travesty if she doesn't get Best Actress. Wow. I've heard great stuff about it. I, I, it's the same director who did The Favorite, right? That, uh, uh, right. yeah, which, which is right. another yes. one that just yes. you're watching one I, thing and then discover I, you're watching something very as different. Much as this, yeah. I, have, I have not really liked his previous films. I adore this Good. film. Uh, it's it's got to be great to um, to have revelations like that, you know, to to, to still have experiences of just yeah, yeah that that joy. But, yeah. And TV show you're currently binging? Um, there's not one, not one that I'm really binging at the moment. I ca I, I caught up uh, a little later than most people because it had it had run its course, I think. Uh, but but I found I found lessons in chemistry, a very touching and endearing show, and I thought uh, I thought its handling of emotion was quite rare, quite unusual, and I thought Brie Larson was great in the show. I will give as suggestions go, although you've probably watched it already. It doesn't come up in, in remotely. Slow horses. You know I have a lot of trouble yeah. with slow horses. Uh, I know I should like. Well, it's got credentials, and it's got Gary Oldman, but I'm sick of Gary Oldman being just a slob <laughs> and nothing else. I, I would really love to know why he's a slob. And, and I've tried several times to get into it, and I haven't been successful yet, and I, I'm not sure I'm going to try again, but... but um, I know I ought to like it. We learn more about his character. I'm not there yet. His character and the motivation or the, the, the downfall uh, becomes clearer over a couple of seasons in relation to, to um, his relationship okay. to Jonathan Price in, in the show. Um, to me, it's one of those uh, we're, yes. we're working our way through Justified for the first time. Um, the, the Timothy Oliphant, Elmore Leonard crime right. show. And I realized it was the same producer who yeah. did Justified, The Americans and Slow Horses. And I thought that is a. That's a pretty good slugging percentage to to have those three shows under your belt. But following the credits for talent is still a pretty worthwhile way of going about yeah, it. Yeah, understandable. So, um, last question I wanted to ask: uh, Did you finish the God the, yeah. the Godfather essay that we talked about last time? Because you were on the fence about whether to include part three, yeah. and I, I don't know if it came out or not. So, it, the essay appeared in Sight okay. and Sound. It was a, a cover story of, I forget now when, about oh maybe a year and a half ago. I'm not sure. Uh, I didn't include part three because I, I, I sort of took the purest view that the real Godfather is parts one and two. And three is a it's from a different world yeah. altogether. But uh, yeah, the, the piece did appear. And it, it was it was very critical of the Godfather as a whole, and I think it upset a lot of people. But you know, people get upset. Okay, like you said, arguing is a lot better than than silence. So <laughs> that's right, exactly right. <laughs> On the strength of that, David, I'm sorry we couldn't do this in person, but I'm so thankful we got to to sit down for another conversation. So it was great. I I love talking to you, and I thank you very Thanks. much. And that was David Thompson. I enjoyed the living heck out of his new book, which is Remotely Travels in the Binge of TV, which is out now from Yale University Press. Like he said, not a critical guide, although you'll get some good recommendations and dissuasions uh, from it. Just like his earlier books that we got to talk about in, in 2022, this one felt like like sitting down with a knowledgeable, opinionated thoughtful friend for a drink, if you know what I mean. Or in this case, two friends, because remotely has David's wife, Lucy, getting her say, too. Uh, 
So go get remotely and uh, you know, turn off the screen for a little while. Now, David has no social media presence and no website. Um, I think he's a lot happier for it. Probably also means he can watch TV without looking down at his iPad or his phone or something the whole time. Now, you can support the Virtual Memory Show by telling other people about it. Let them know there's this podcast comes out every week with really interesting conversations with fascinating creative people. You can also help out the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it and who you'd like to hear me record with or what movie or TV show or book or piece of music or theater, or art exhibition, whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. And you can do that by email, by DM if we're connected on social media, um, and by sending me a postcard or a letter. My mailing address is at the bottom of the uh, uh, email I send out twice a week. Um, or by leaving a message on my Google Voice number. And that's 973-869-9659. That goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me. And messages can be up to three minutes long. You go longer than that, you get cut off, just call back, leave a second message. And let me know if it would be okay to include your message in an upcoming episode of the show. You might have something interesting to share with the listeners, but I'd never run something like that without the speaker's permission. So, you know, let me know. If you got money to spare, don't give it to me. I mean, you know, it's nice. I appreciate the, the gesture and the support, but really there are a lot of other people who are in a lot um, – a lot more pressing need than I am, certainly. Uh, and you can find individuals through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Crowdfunder, uh, and all other crowdfunding platforms. When you do that, you'll find people who need help with uh, rent, uh, veterinary bills, medical bills, car payments, uh, artistic projects they're trying to launch, all sorts of stuff that'll really make a difference in people's lives. And when it comes to institutions, I give to my local food bank every month, uh, make occasional contributions to the Poor People's Campaign, uh, targeted election contributions because I'm a lobbyist, um, but there are freedom funds, women's choice and Planned Parenthood and, and other sorts of funds you can donate to. So, you know, basically this stuff all goes toward trying to build a better world. So, you know, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading. Keep making art and keep the conversation going.